We are in our third week talking and about and taking a look at our purpose statement. Won't we all say this together? Making disciples who glorify God by loving Him and loving others. This morning we move um, from our discussions and our call to discipleship that we found in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which is the what? Making disciples that glorify God to kind of the how, and so we move into the greatest command. And this week we'll talk about loving God. And next week we'll wrap up with loving others, loving your neighbor. You know, one of the rich blessings of us as a congregation reading through Scripture together is kind of revisiting some of those stories maybe we hadn't spent some time in and just kind of getting a, a, a picture of these people that are totally sold out with God. And, and we see that their ebb and flow of their relationship with God and how it strengthens and their faith that they're able to do some incredible things. And sometimes I, I found myself just wanting to, to jump in on those situations. And you, you get kind of snapshots in your mind. You're like, wouldn't it be great? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to be standing there on the banks of the Red Sea with Miriam and, and Moses as they're leading the, the people in praise and just going nuts in Yes, Lord, you have delivered us. And thank you so much as you see the Egyptian army just and the, the threat that's bearing down upon them being taken care of. God's in control. It, it would be hard to just lift up praise to him and say, yes, God. Or a few years later, you have Joshua that's leading the people into the promised land. And their first obstacle, obviously, is the huge fortified city of Jericho. And just this whole plan that God puts forth for them to march around for seven days. And you're like, is this going to work? And then that last day marching around seven times. And then what's the signal? They're going to blow the trumpet. And then to hear this rumble. And the walls come crashing down. Wouldn't that, can you imagine being around the campfire that night going, did you see the look on the guys on the wall? It just, God is awesome. And then to have the story of King David way back when, when he was just a young boy taking the supplies out to his brothers, and he sees the big Goliath, you know, over nine feet tall, he's out there, and everyone's afraid to go out, and he goes, I'll go out there. You see him bending down in the stream, picking up the, the smooth stones, and he goes out, and wham, knocks him down. That's incredible. Wouldn't you love to just be there on the battle lines watching that take place? Would that strengthen your relationship with God? And, and so we're, we find ourselves in the midst of these stories I can't imagine being a witness there, but I had to tell you, it would not be hard to truly love God and trust Him implicitly. But I think sometimes that we forget that after this, that before this deliverance with Moses leading them out, that came after 400 years in the minds of the people of unanswered prayers. God, we've been pleading for you. We're held here in bondage, and yet we're hearing nothing. We also remember the story of Joshua that after the walls came down to Jericho, they're all excited and they're celebrating God. A few days later, they go up to the next town, which is Ai, and they're routed. And because of the sin of one man, Achan, 36 of his fellow soldiers and Achan's family all lost their life because of his sin. How are you doing with God on that day? <laughs> Joshua just rent his clothes. What about David? is no longer bending down by the stream to pick up stones, but is bending down so he can pray and lift up and plead with God for the life of his newborn son with Bathsheba, only to have God answer no. What do we do with that? How do we develop a true love for God no matter what? Several weeks ago, we looked at the powerful passage in James chapter 1 and verse 17 that I try to read over from time to time just to remind me that God is the source of all things. And every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. And when we're experiencing these blessings, and we're experiencing these gifts, and all the things, sometimes it's, it's good for us to step back and say, God, thank you. What do we do when we don't feel like that we're in that sweet spot? Those blessings aren't coming. What do we do when we're praying and, and lifting up things and, man, when we 
do we feel the same closeness and affection to our Heavenly Father when He says, not yet, we're striving to find someone to spend life with? Or what do we do when there's no relief in sight for our finances and we've been asking God, but yet no doors seem to be opening up? What do we do when we enter the doctor's office and receive the news that no one wants to hear? Have you developed a faith that will see you through those times? Have you developed a no matter what kind of love for God, no matter what life throws our way, Lord, I am with you. I am with you to the end, and I want you to be in my presence, and I want to be in your presence, and Lord, I want to go through life with you. Well, to help us answer that question, I want us to look at one of the most challenging stories, I think, in the life of Christ, and it's in John chapter 11, if you'd like to follow along. It's the story of Lazarus. And as you're turning over to John chapter 11, I'll just tell you a little bit about, kind of give, give you a frame of reference. Bethany is the town, and it's a bedroom community east of Jerusalem, and it was home to the sisters Mary and Martha that we talk about and their brother Lazarus. In John chapter 11, verse 5, it says, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. You know, Jesus has different encounters with various people that he comes in and he changes their life and then they go on and there, there's no record that they're coming back. But this is, is not that family. This is his family that feeds him. This is his family that, that helps strengthen him and encourage him. And In fact, this loving term it is only used for John, the beloved disciple. That's how close he was with Mary and with Martha and with Lazarus. And so when Lazarus falls gravely ill, the women know where Jesus is. Even though he's traveling around, they have a connection. And so they, they send a messenger to send a report that the one you love, didn't even have to mention his name, Lazarus. Jesus is going to know. Just say the one you love has fallen ill to come quick. Knowing his love for Lazarus, the 12 disciples, when they get this word, and those that are kind of reading along in John, expect Jesus to just drop everything and almost run, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I hate to leave you, I've got something pressing, it's an emergency, we've got to head towards Bethany to intervene on behalf of his dear friend. But instead, Jesus hears a report about Lazarus' illness, his response almost kind of uh, sterile in, in his comments because he gives the same response as with the man that was born blind in John chapter 9. He's like, well, the final result of this tragedy is that God is going to be glorified and death will not win the victory. So it, it's not a denial that Lazarus is going to pass since this is definitely it's going to be part of the story as we'll see. But death will not gain a foothold. Death is not going to have the final word in this man's life. So he's telling them what's going to happen before it even takes place. So the tragedy is not by God's design, but God is going, has a will for it, and he's going to use it as an opportunity to glorify his son Jesus. But you still kind of expect kind of more of a reaction like we would have to immediately depart, to go and be and be a part of this thing. But unexplainably, Jesus kind of remains and says what he's doing for another two days. And this delay does not cause the death of Lazarus. Because by the time that he makes it, it's been four days. So chances are that when the messenger left to go and, and find Jesus, probably a day away, that he passed not long after that. But yet, the text lets us know that Jesus had divine knowledge of what was going to happen in the situation. And in fact, as the disciples are heading back and they're heading towards Jerusalem and then on to Bethany, he lets them know what's going to happen. He tries to prepare his disciples that Lazarus, our friend, is not going to recover from this illness. And just because Jesus knows the fate of Lazarus, it doesn't explain the delay. And we have to wonder what's going on. You know, my father passed away in, in 2003. Um, we didn't speed to get back to East Texas uh, because it, it, it was not um, an emergency. But yet, we dropped everything and uh, we packed up bags and, and quickly made something to eat just to, to get ready. And, and we were in the car within a, a matter of moments to head back because we wanted to be with family. We wanted to grieve together. We wanted to be there for my mom. And just for him to delay, you have to kind of wonder what exactly is going on 
But this delay further emphasizes the significance of what's going to trans- transpire here, this miraculous work. And so it kind of brings us to the idea that the urgency that we feel in various situations that we're going through may not be the same divine urgency within which our Heavenly Father works. Because our first point is trials that we go through help us to reveal God's purpose. You know, at this phase of His ministry, Jesus' aim is to reveal the glory of God's work in Him and, and thereby his help and uh, kind of galvanize an unshakable faith in His followers. That's what Jesus knows has to, ta- has to transpire. He knows this thing is coming to a boil. He knows his time is in, on earth is, is short. So he's got to instill this. John 11 and verse 14 says this, So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. So that you may believe. Let us go to him. May believe what? What is this final sign? John lays out seven signs. What's this final thing? The seven I am's. What's this last thing that he's got to share with them? Jesus not only has power over the wind and the waves, which is important. Jesus not only has power to to bring sight to the blind, Jesus not only has power, which is incredible, over the demonic world to where they will will flee if, if he calls them out. He now has to show that he has power of a whole new reality. Power over death, which is just incredible to us. But if you're a parent, don't you kind of understand this? This whole way that, that God knows some things and God's urgency is different than ours? I mean, how many times as a parent, your, your child or your teen will come to you with something that is in the world for them? And, and they've got to have this or they've got to go do this. And sometimes we have the ability to kind of take a step back and, and objectively survey a situation and go, you're not going to, your, your life is not going to end if you don't get to go to this party or if you don't have this latest technology. You're going to survive because we can look at the bigger picture and see what we hope will happen in the lives of our children. But even if you don't have children, or don't you remember times when your parents would do things that would just drive you nuts? And you didn't agree with what was happening at the time, but later you can reflect as the ultimate thing that your parents were trying to do on your, you know, on your behalf. And if we understand that as parents and as children, why is it so hard to trust God? Why is it so hard that if, if, if life doesn't go as scripted, can we not trust that God loves us and has the best, best path forward for our lives and for his kingdom, even if this is a choice that we would never make in a million years. Can we trust that God loves us so much to make the right choice for us? Are we willing to love and trust him no matter what? Isaiah 55 and verse 9, the Lord shares, as the heavens are higher than the earth, there's a distance there. We're so small in understanding uh, even what's going on in, in the universe around us. He says, as there's that gap, there's also a gap in my ways and your ways, in my thoughts and your thoughts. We've got to trust our Heavenly Father. You know, as I mentioned earlier, when Jesus arrives in Bethany, picking up the story in John chapter 11, Lazarus has, been, has passed away and has been in the tomb for four days now when he arrives And the mourners still remain there in Bethany and they're still crying out in the streets when he arrives. And as he's getting close and kind of pulling up and drawing near, Martha discovers that Jesus and his disciples are are just on the outskirts of of, of town. And they go and they talk with him. And I, I can imagine just how much it ripped Jesus' heart out for Martha to say, Lord, if you had been here, if you'd only been here, you could have healed my brother. So she's, she's crying out in pain, but she's also expressing the power that she sees in, in Jesus, the Son of God. Martha gets pushed by Jesus to a deeper level of discussion. And he says, Martha, your brother will rise again. Oh, and she kind of says, well, yeah, I understand. All of us kind of believe in one day there's going to be a resurrection. He says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. John 11 and verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me is going to live, even though he who dies 
And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you have faith that I can bring this about through my heavenly Father? Which brings us to our second point. Trials reveal God's power. When we are out, totally out of our league and out of control in a situation, God can reveal himself and reveal his power in a situation. So this is the most profound of the I am statements. I am the life. I am this resurrection. And Jesus is asking here, can you embrace this reality and believe in Jesus' lordship? Believe that he has power over death. And if it's true that he has a resurrection in his life, then the raising of Lazarus is only going to manifest his power and display how authentic his statement truly is. So Martha affirms her faith in him that he is the Messiah and he is the Son of God. And so in verse 28, we see the most gripping part of the story where Mary, the other sister, comes out. The one that spent time at Jesus' feet. And you can just tell she is wiped out. She's totally emotionally exhausted. She comes and just collapses at Jesus' feet. The mourners, her friends, have come out to meet Jesus with them. They're all crying and wailing. It just becomes so much for Jesus to kind of take in. And so we have this thing coming, and she kind of repeats this. If only you had been here, Lord, Lazarus would still be with us. John 11 and verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping who had come with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This word for troubled, it's this internal just grinding that's taking place. So Jesus knows what's about to happen. He knows the power. He knows what God's plan is in this situation, but yet it's ripping him up on the inside. This same word for, for troubled in the Greek is used a chapter later in John 12 and verse 27 on the night when he's going to be arrested. It says, now my heart is troubled. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. No, it's for this very reason that I came. We need to understand that just because Jesus is there and he knows what the outcome is going to be, it doesn't mean that he's not there wrestling with us. It doesn't mean that he's not troubled and torn up and his heart's not broken as our heart is broken as well. Our final point this morning is trials reveal God's passion. God's passion for his people that lean on him. Well, backing up the proclamation that he is the resurrection, he said, fellas, let's roll back that stone. John 11 and 44, the dead man came out, his hands and feet, wrapped with strips of linen and the cloth around his face and Jesus said to them take off his grave clothes and let him go so not only did he restore his good friend restore this loved one to this family that he cares about so much what he's describing and showing for the people is death is not going to carry the day and pointed to the reality of another tomb that is not going to hold him either It will not be able to contain him. Satan will not win. This fallen world will not rule the day, but yet his heavenly Father. I'm going to invite Beverly Ross to come up and share just a little bit about her story. Beverly, I would imagine that it's hard for you this morning to just kind of remain a spectator in the whole story of Lazarus and kind of remain on the sidelines. Just share just a little bit about, uh, about your family and some of the things you guys have gone through the past couple of years. It's even hard to talk after hearing uh, Brad read these passages and emphasize some of the things that you just did so very well. This story is for God in flesh meets human pain and suffering. Um, This time, three years ago, on February 1st, my firstborn child, 31 years old, um, a boot camp mama running in marathons, uh, got the diagnosis that she had the flu. Didn't, that was on a Monday evening, 
Tuesday didn't get better. Wednesday didn't get better. Thursday morning, early, her husband took her back to the doctor where they asked him to take her to the hospital that she needed some fluids. She was dehydrated. And so I canceled clients for the day. I wanted to be with her. My husband went with me. We got to Baylor Grapevine. Where the emergency room doctor looked at my son-in-law and me and said, we've got a 60-40 chance. And we looked at each other and said, of what? And the doctor turned around and looked at us kindly but firmly and said, of life. Her lungs are filled with fluid, one 100%, one 75%. We aren't sure what's going on. So they put Jenny in intensive care in isolation. She had a gas, I mean, an oxygen mask on that she was holding. I remember when we got up there, she took it down and whispered to me because she couldn't talk. And she said, Mom, I can't believe I'm this sick. And I said, well, apparently you're pretty sick, but we're in a really good place, and it won't be long. You're going to be well. It's going to be good. We've got good doctors. The moment I saw our doctor, I had such confidence in him, and it, it remained. What began on February 4th was the fight for her life. We found out within 12 hours that Jenny never had the flu at all. It had been group A strep and had gone without an antibiotic. She was septic. She was an organ failure. She was on dialysis. Her liver had, had failed. They thought that maybe it would regenerate itself. She was vented within 12 hours, so I never heard her voice again. To watch her younger brothers gather by her bed to watch her friends gather because Jenny was such a strong woman, a woman who would have spoken into this moment with grace, with commitment. We had over 13,000 people join us in praying. Now her friends put together the caring page. Yes. And so I, I got on there about the second day as word filtered over here, and then watching it grow by 500, 1,000, several thousand, they get up to 13,000 people around the world that yes. are praying and enter, entering into the story with your family. It was yes. incredible. We absolutely could not... I could not see how the outcome could be anything but life. As a mother, I refused to believe that it was as serious as the doctors were telling us that it was. I prayed repetitively for God just to wiggle an eyelash. I knew the story in John. I knew the stories of the power of the Lord. And I knew the, when the kids would come to me as they were writing on the care pages and would say, Mom, what do you want us to write today? I would say, we need a wow moment. That's what we're going to ask for today. At one point, our doctor, who was a Hindu, came out and he looked at the ground and he was shaking his head. And he said, I'm starting to believe in things I've never believed in before. And I said, you just watch. You just watch what God's going to do. He is amazing. He said, I'm starting to believe that. We would get better. We would plunge worse. We would get better. The word they kept using, our staff was so sweet with us, and we still have remained friends with several on our staff. The word they kept using is we're trending well. We're trending well. On February 17th, we amputated her legs below the knee. She fought so hard that she lost teeth in the vent. On February 20th, one of the nurses called us crying, and she said the seizures had started, and we knew that that was not good. It meant the infection had crossed the blood-brain barrier, and that's a big deal. I still didn't give up hope. I knew we were going to have to fight hard. I knew it was going to be long. But I knew, I felt like with that many, particularly young people praying, 
and who's, who I felt like their faith was on the line here praying that God was going to pull it out. So we would just go, oh, God, we just knew. We just knew. Now, I've been teaching for years. This was not new for me. I've been teaching for years that we do not always get our way. I've been teaching for years that God is still God no matter what, that God is worthy to be worshipped no matter what. But for those days in the hospital, I did not allow my head to go into the no matter what. I'm her mother. On February 22nd, I was in the waiting room. And the seizures were so difficult for me to watch. And our sweet nurse kn knew that. And so when I was in the room and a seizure would start, our nurse Karen would position her body between me and Jenny. And she became my voice to Jenny as she would rub Jenny's hair and soothe her through the seizures. We're still good friends. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful. But when I was in the waiting room, I stood up to welcome a woman, one of our elders' wives from years past. And when I stood up to welcome her, I felt a magnetic draw to get back to Jenny. And I said, I'll be right back. I have to go check on Jenny, but I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, because I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. When I got back, our nurse was on the phone, and our eyes met. And she said, Jenny has plummeted. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, I don't know, but we're going to take her down for a test. And at that point, our charge nurse, her name was Shiny, came into the room. And Shiny had whispered to me very early on day one of Jenny's hospital stay. She said, I'm a believer too. And so she would come into my room and we would pray together. And Shiny, I'm so grateful, she was in, in charge of the situation that day. And Shiny walked in before they took Jenny down for a CAT scan and she lowered the guardrail. And the guardrail had not been lowered at all. And she said, you need to tell her bye. And our eyes locked. And she said it firmly again, you need to tell her goodbye. I am a marriage and family therapist. I've taught grief workshops in Africa. I've taught grief workshops all over the country. And I looked at her and I said, I know how to teach people how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And she said, yes, you do. Just tell her goodbye. And I said, what if it's too early? What if it's too early? She said, do it anyway. My husband was in the room and my son-in-law was in the room. And so I began to tell Jenny goodbye just for the CAT scan. That's all I could let my head go to right then, just for the CAT scan. As we stroked her and as we loved on her, I was all I could do not to crawl in that bed right beside her and hold her like I did when she was two. I took her down and then our doctors walked in. I'm very comfortable with my tears. I just hope I can continue to talk through them. And I'm going to attempt it, but if you can't understand me, I may pause again, okay? You're doing fine. This is a new cry for me. I've never been much of a crier, but now when I cry, my throat locks. It is so raw. When our doctors came in, our first doctor, Dr. Kalapara, the Hindu, said, we're going to call a surgeon. We're getting a surgeon over here. We're taking care of this. Our other doctor, Lester, who's a believer, looked at me and said, we're going to examine her first. And they closed the white curtain, which was the first time it had been closed with me on the other side. I could hear Dr. Kalapara on the phone, and then I heard his phone click. And they came out, and Dr. Kalapara said, we need to talk. So they took us in. They told us how to maneuver. We had been in so much trouble with hospital security. We had violated all the fire codes. We, had, we filled every waiting room. In fact, 
this was a bunch of young people, you know? And so they knew who was going to run, like, from this way. They had a pass planned. They just made fun little games in the waiting room, and they had pass planned on, okay, you're going to take the news to that waiting room, then you'll tag it, and you'll go to that waiting room. You'll tag it, you'll go to that one. And so the doctors knew that, and they were like, stay on our heels. Do not look at anyone in the waiting room. You stay on my heel. We're going to have to go through that waiting room to get to the family room, but we have got to talk to you. Do not stop. And so we did that. We did not look. We, we stayed on our path. We got to the room, and Dr. Kalapara said, it's done. There's no brain activity. I remember laying back on that couch and looking up at the ceiling, and I said, but I don't know what to do now. And what I really meant is I don't know how to do life without Jenny. I was 21 when she was born. I was a baby. I grew up beside her. But we went in, and this time there were 11 of us. Her friends had gathered, our tight group of friends had gathered. My sister was there. The boys still were not there. It was a Monday. They had gone home on Sunday to do church. I do not remember this happening, but Shiny, our charge nurse, told me two weeks later, when we went back to the hospital, she said, do you remember your prayer? I said, I don't remember the prayer. And she said, Beverly, you begin to pray when we were in that room alone. And she said, you prayed, but I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to walk this road. I want to hit a pause on the prayer because I want to tell you the whole time Jenny was in, there's two verses I could not get off my mind. I could not read my Bible while she was in the hospital. If I were going to beg you, There's about three things that I want to beg of you, and this is one of them. If I were going to beg you today to do something, I would beg you. I mean, I would like to hold your hands and stare into your eyes and beg you to prepare while you are walking in the light for what you will do when darkness comes. Because when darkness comes, you can't think. When darkness comes, you can't prepare. You're, you're resting in your uh, re, 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 re reservoir of faith. You're resting in what do I know to be truth. You're clinging at that point to where your history with God has, has been. I am not telling you. I do not want to be, I don't, I don't want you to walk away from here today and think, wow, what a pessimistic story. I'm just telling you, darkness happens because we are walking on dirt. Right. We're walking on dirt, and darkness is real. And when the lights go out, have something that you can cling to. Well, I could not read. There were two verses the whole entire time Jenny was in. I could not get out of my head. One is in Isaiah 45.3. It's God speaking. Where God says, I will give you the treasures of darkness. Riches stored in secret places. So that you may know that I am the God of Israel who summons you by name. Now I want to be very clear with that verse. It does not say that God gives darkness. It said God gives the treasures of darkness. What that means to me is Satan does not win. God prevails. God wins. And then the other verse was in Daniel 3.17. The song that was chosen, you know how young people do, and I like it too, is they pick a theme song for every event in life. And the theme song chosen during our hospital stay was Mighty to Save. We had an eye home in Jenny's room, and her friends would take home an iPod, or multiple iPods, and we would trade it out constantly, worship music playing in her room, 24 at 7, all the time, worship music. And Mighty to Save was on everybody's iPod. We were clinging to God is mighty to save, and he is, true. He is mighty to save. He could have done this.
the verse in Daniel 3 says, O king, our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we will never serve another. And Shiny said, when you were praying, you stopped your prayer. And she said, you went around that room. And she said, you looked into everyone's eyes and you said, promise me this day. On February 22nd, 2010, promise me that you will not walk away from faith because of this moment. And Shiny said, you even made me promise <laughs> that I would not walk away from faith because of this moment. We were walking out of her room, and I remember looking at my husband, who's a lot taller than me. And what I really wanted to do I wanted to grab his shirt because I was so filled with anxiety. I wanted to grab his shirt, but I didn't. I put my hands on Rick's chest, and I said, you have got to remind me right now that what we believe is truth because it's going to change the way I live every day for the rest of my life. It will change every step that I take. And my precious man... He was preaching in Decatur, Texas this morning. Looked into me with his gorgeous blue eyes and he spoke to me. The tomb is empty. Brothers and sisters, we live on the road to Emmaus. We live in the already. The cross has happened. And we live with the not yet. Our tombs are full. But there is a day. There is a day. As we were walking out of the hospital, another thing that I have taught for years that became something I was clinging to that day. It seemed like a very long walk as we were going to tell a nine-year-old that her mommy had died. And I remember thinking, so this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like. I've taught for a very long time that God's presence does not depend on if you feel him. This morning, there's probably somebody sitting here that you're thinking, I don't feel the presence of the Lord today. Maybe because of your own history, maybe because of what's going on right now. But, oh, brothers and sisters, can I tell you this day, with all the boldness I can muster in my heart, that the Lord is here. Whether you feel him or you don't, the Lord is present. That's not based on if you feel him. It's based on that's what he says. Right. Oh, what a beautiful song we sang. And I have to tell you, when I saw the list of the songs yesterday, I was like, yippee, these songs are just for me. <laughs> What a ministry you have been into my brokenness this day. As we sang 10,000 reasons. As we sang never once. And while we sang that song, I was picturing walking out of the hospital. Oh Lord, even then, you did not leave me. Even when the road has been tough since then, Coming up on 36 months, and 36 months just sounds better to me than three years. I still resist the year thing. He has not left me. He gets that. And then we opened her funeral with the song that we sang, Blessed Be Your Name. Our youngest son, the worship minister at Bamel, when Brad and Jill were there. Jonathan opened his sister's funeral with a story about her. I used to think that God prepared me for Jenny's death. I'm not sure that I think that anymore. What I think now is God prepares all of his people to suffer. Because my daughter taught me how to suffer. Jenny struggled with secondary infertility. She had one baby so easily and then absolutely could not get pregnant again. And particularly in church settings, it can be a very hard road. You're going to lots of baby showers. You're celebrating with people. 
and you're crying out to the Lord, oh, I just want a baby. Jenny was a children's minister. Her passion was children. She wanted, they wanted a lot of babies. And she had a lot of people praying for yes. her, but she didn't want that to define her as a she person. She did not. She did not. Our family went, went on a fast, and we decided that we're all going to give up one thing to help us remember to pray for Jenny every day. At this particular time, we decided to do this. We were, uh, Jenny was struggling with some de depression over the infertility. And so uh, we all gave up something, and we were going to pray that either she get pregnant or she come to peace with infertility. David and Jenny did not know we were praying this. At Thanksgiving on this year, Jenny called a family me meeting. It was our year to do everybody at Thanksgiving. And at this family meeting, she said, Mom, do you remember when I was a little girl and you taught me to plan my funeral? And I said, I do remember that. Can I add the sidebar to that right now? As I absolutely never thought I'd be here for it. But I did teach my kids to plan their funeral. I have planned my funeral. And by that, I mean I know the characteristics that when my life on earth is done, I know what I want to be remembered for. And Jenny said, Mom, I don't want people to walk by my casket someday and say, oh, there's that poor and fertile woman. She said, I want people to walk by my casket and to say there is a woman who continues to praise the Lord when she didn't get her way. Amen. And I tell you today, I'm living out my daughter's legacy. I am a woman who has decided to continue to praise the Lord. And I didn't get my way. God is still God, whether we get our way or we don't, truth. Yeah. Now, you ended up driving out to West Texas uh, as... You and Rick have both been on a journey, and it uh, sounds good, but yet it didn't happen, and it, it's still an ongoing process. And just share about that kind of visual thing that you saw that helped you just piece together some things. You know, very early at Jenny's visitation, Randy Harris, has he been here? walked in. Uh, Brady Bryce walked in. They all walked in together. And Diane Cope, who's Mike Cope's wife, and they buried a 12-year-old daughter. They all walked in together. And I immediately looked at them and I said, I can't picture Jenny happy. I can't picture Jenny happy without her daughter. I, I can't. And I, I was going to them because to me, those are three very deep, spiritually deep people. And I was going to them for help. Help me picture this. Help me get to the next chapter. I'm an overachiever of sorts. And Randy just looked at the ground and shook his head. And Brady looked right past me to the back wall. And Diane just looked into my eyes, but no one spoke. And I knew right there that this huge door had opened and that I was being ushered in to ground that was spiritually rocky. And that even people that I deeply trust to guide me spiritually would not have answers. This was going to be something I had to walk through. Feeling for the wall in the dark. Knowing light is at the end. But it didn't feel light. About 16 months after that, I was driving to Abilene to speak, right past Ranger Hill. I looked over to the right, and there was just this huge, huge stretch of parched ground. It looked like a bomb had gone off. There were crevices in this ground. It was gray. It was just ugly. I really wanted with my journal to do a UE and go sit on that land for a while, but I couldn't. I was almost out of gas. I knew I didn't have enough gas to do a UE and get to, to the loves. I know the way to ACU very well. I knew I didn't have enough. So I pulled over, and in my journal, I wrote, Death has created for me a spiritual earthquake. And it has left me sifting through the rubble to find the remnants of my faith. How grateful 
I am this day that there are some remnants that I found that I can cling to. Scriptures that just take on whole new meanings yes. for you. Yes. People, memories, times yes. where God has been there for you. Yes. His faithfulness. His faithfulness. Now, it brings me pain for people to address um, something like um, so-and-so was healed because of their great faith. Right. That still hurts me. Um, praise God, he is so good, so-and-so was healed because where I said, I'm going to praise God and he is so good and my way did not happen. So there's some things I believe that people's faiths have been shaken by our easy pat answers. True. And so now with every microphone that is offered to me, <laughs> I want to continue to speak. Persevere, sweet friends. Persevere. In the end, God wins. One, one last thing. John 12 talks about after Lazarus has mm. been raised, yes. that there's a feast yes. at his house. And it says Lazarus... Uh, is reclining next to Jesus. Martha is serving, and Mary comes in. And instead of the aroma of death that should have been there, it was the aroma of the perfume as Mary pours it out. Talk to us briefly about how communion has changed. That time of communion together has changed for you and for Rick. Okay. Uh, one of the key words, I believe, a theme of Scripture is re remember. Remember. And now what we do every Sunday when we get to feast at the table of the Lord is we want to remember what he's done, his faithfulness in history, and we're remembering forward with claiming his promise. There is an elder and his wife that have also lost an adult daughter who sits at the end of my row or maybe right behind me when my grandkids are all there. They may sit right there. Sometime during our time together, we will all four exchange a look, and one of us will say, we take turns, one of us will say, he is risen. And the other one always speaks back, he is risen indeed. Sometimes Rick will just look at me and say, remember, the tomb is empty. Remember, the blood makes this possible. And it is my spiritual air. It is my intubation. And I always say intubation like this because at the end, Jenny was trached. And so I always say it like that. It is my intubation. It has become my spiritual air. Yeah. Lincoln, why don't you lead us in a song as we prepare to take of these emblems and take of this time together and this feast that we're talking about. Thank you so much. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory 